Yeah. You still with that? Yeah. How's that feel? It feels good. I, uh, I definitely prefer that to what I was doing before Google Box. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's a little bit nicer. So, okay. So I'm going to be talking about uh, a handful of early gadgets, things that would surprise you. That was, uh, was Garrett's subtitle there. Um, uh, my name is Jesse Gum, by the way. Quick introduction. There we go. Um, so, before I go jumping into scaring everybody away from the language, I'm just going to start by saying your language is great. And there's a couple of reasons the language is great. One, it's a functional language, which automatically pushes you into the upper echelon, the, the higher level of intelligence in the, uh, the programming community. Um, and Erlang has some semantics that lend itself to easy to read code. And I think a lot of that kind of comes back, it's part of the culture, and I think a lot of that comes back to um, some of the, the, the early versions before, like, I don't know, R14 or R15, where you didn't get line numbers in errors. So, like, when you had an error message back in, you know, older Erlang, you, all you got was the, was the name of the function. This function crashed for this reason, and then if you had, you know, if you have a 400 line function, that's not exactly going to help you out anymore. Um, so I think that kind of helped to contribute to the tendency of making functions short and concise and very specific. Um, and then of course Erlang has had concurrency nailed since the beginning. Um, and that's kind of what make it, makes it so, uh, makes it popular. And how it's influenced lots and lots of other languages. So while Erlang is great, it has its mysteries. And one of the very first mysteries that Erlang newbies run into is the whole strings and lists thing. Um, can you guys read this, this miscellaneous line? But you can, well, I'll just do it in the thing. No, that's, yeah, that was a lot of words. <laughs> Let's go, uh, It's 
something else, tuple module one, two. What the hell did that just do? What that's doing is, let's see if this is the next one. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. Okay. The module part of a function call in our line can be a tuple. And this is what it does. It remaps it into a normal module function call. And it starts, it takes the, you know, so you got the module atom, it moves it over here. It takes the whole chunk of uh, the, the module and then a list of whatever else is the rest of the tuple. And it throws it at the end of a function call. And it adds, it adds an area to it. And then it just takes the others and puts it at the beginning. Real cryptic. It's, it's not, I mean, when you've done it enough, you get the feel for it, but it's still like, what is this construct and why does it exist? Because that's just, that's just a little weird. Um, and as a quick, uh, quick rehash before I jump into the next thing here, um, is records, if you're familiar with, uh, Erlang records are basically named tools where it will take, you know, we define it, we, we say define my rec and we throw in some fields. This creates like a, like a structure that's reusable in code. And then uh, you can use this, this helpful syntax, helpful syntax, um, my rec being the name of the record that we used here and specify the values of the fields. And all that ultimately gets done with the Erlang compiler is it changes it to a tool. So after the Erlang compiler runs through it, all of your record stuff is all just tuples anyways. Um, the reason I bring that up is because then you can use records as tuple modules. So you define your record here, and then you can actually call, like so we got in this example, I have this whole chunk of my rec here, is used to then call with function AB, and it gets translated to a normal looking Erlang call thing. Yeah, go ahead. Is there a reason why you would ever want to use that syntax? I'll get to it. I'm working on it. It's, it's, it's a total mess. Like right here, most people should be confused and being like, what the hell are you talking about? Why are you doing this? Um, this is early gadgets. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this leads into the convenient, if possibly unclear by early convention, syntactical construct. So the reason you could then do this, take advantage of this, is so we can define rec equals my record, blah, blah, blah. And then you can treat it almost like an object-oriented type of approach, where you call rec function AB, and it does exactly the same thing. So rec right here is this tool. So it's kind of a convenient thing, um, but you got to be careful with it, because it starts leading you down a rabbit hole that you probably don't want to end. So like this says, um, this can make your code different. It's, uh, and this, all of this has been set up. <laughs> all of this has been set up to Erlang's most controversial, deprecated, experimental feature that's surprisingly, but I guess not that surprisingly popular. Um, if any of you watch the mailing list, or if any of you uh, know anything of Chicago Boss, um, that leads us to parameter modules. This abomination that uh, uh, Evan Miller is probably the biggest proponent of, but he's not in the Erlang world anymore. <laughs> um, so parameter modules, and I'll come back to how these all tie together. Um, in a parameter module, you can define a module with arguments. Um, keep in mind this syntax has been deprecated, so I don't recommend you do it. But um, you can define a module that has arguments and then use it in an actual, an actual way. So I'll show you a demonstration parameter module here. So this is a very small thing. All it does is you define a, um, you make this call pmod new. So we have this pmod. Let's see. Is this a little bit? Oh, I can just find that. So we'll call pmod new one two. Hey, it loaded. So, what we did here, and I'll do it again here. One, two, one, two. So this p, this this p variable now has the value p mod one two, and we can use 
use this then? There's nothing different about that from a tuple. That's a tuple. It is. It is literally. It is literally like a reference. Or no. There's nothing. There's nothing magical about it. It's. It's. Yeah. It's just a tuple. I feel the But I mean, but feel free to do it. It's the same thing. Um, so, um, yeah. It's. It literally. It's just the same thing. But the confusing thing is, it, we have this PMod module. We do not have a new function anywhere in here. Uh, and this is part of the whole magic of parse transforms, which is why, um, which is why they're so um, hated. Because magic is bad. Um, so we have this PMod new, and we can treat it. We can use this this P thing as a. Um, as an object-oriented type approach. So we can call change B, <coughs> give it value 5, and it just changes our PMOD, uh, changes our, our, our thing to 1 and 5. It's, I mean, it's, it's a very object-oriented like construct, but it still kind of fits into the, um, you know, it's not like it's, it's it, the variables are still immutable, so it's not like anything's changing, um, with, you know, without your permission. Uh, but so the idea here is that just it, 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 these parameter modules, they they do some magic when when they're added, and what they're doing is they're taking this these functions. It's automatically creating a new function that takes these two arguments that are defined in the module definition, and it's then adding uh, it's adding two uh, one more uh, one more arguments to each function. So a change a x ends up becoming change a x, and then that tu that tu that tuple p mod a b, and that gets passed into every function. So it gives you this this kind of, and that's what this is telling you. So it it automatically modifies all the functions that are exported to give them uh, an arity of plus one. So they have they take one more function call than normal. And all your variables, all your variables from any module definition are available in the function code. So to kind of reiterate this, even though in this function, like in this view function, we don't have any variables that are actually defined, it's just using A and B, and it's pulling them from the, 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 the module, uh, the, the parameter module itself. So um, it's like a closure yeah. for the module. Yeah. So this now this syntactic construct was deprecated. It was, I mean, it wasn't even deprecated because it was never official. It was added as an experimental feature. Some people picked up on it, thought it was awesome, used it. Chicago Boss uses it extensively. Like without without parameter modules, it's basically not Chicago Boss. And then uh, and then the OTP team was like, nah, we don't really like this so much, and they just took it out. Um, but it was never documented. It was never real. And the reason I bring it up is because I encountered. The first time I encountered this, I was like, what is this? I don't understand what's going on here. This is all magic. And you know, through experimenting and looking at the code and seeing what it's doing, I figured it out, but there wasn't any documentation for it. And I only bring it up because there are projects out there that use this construct. Um, Chicago Boss uses it, uh, Simple Bridge uses it shortly, a little bit soon be phased out. Um, MochiWeb uses it. Um, though I think that has also been kind of fixed and not use it anymore, but it's still usable in that context. A lot of these projects that originally relied on using parameter modules have ultimately just been rewritten to use the tuple module function without actually uh, using the, the, the parse transform necessary to enable parameter modules in your code. So as kind of a, a reminder, or the, like a, a demonstration, these two modules are exactly the same. They do exactly the same thing. It's just made explicit what the parameter module magic is doing. And that's all. That's it. There's, there's um, you know, it adds a new function. Uh, it's automatically appending this, um, this construct into here. And then it's doing it for each function. It's just adding one more function and passing in that tuple P mod AB into every function in that module. So those modules are completely the same, and let's just do this and see if this stops. All right. So, big warning: using parameter modules will incur the wrath of the Erlang mailing list. Uh, this is one of the 
this has always been one of the hot topics of the Erlang list. Um, so even though, uh, even though the Erlang community is super friendly and super amazing, and that's one of the things Garrett was talking about earlier this week on the main list, was just how great the Erlang community is. When you bring up parameter modules, make sure you're wearing armor because they're going to attack you ferociously. Ask how you can manage them with an abnormal Just throw it in your sure it's going Because it'll be an education. It'll learn. <laughs> yeah. It'll, it'll be a lot of fun. You'll, uh, yeah. So there you go. Um, and of course, a recommendation, if you're going to use parameter modules, if you're going to go down this route, make sure you name your stuff appropriately, like more so than normal. Like most early code is relatively easy to read because you know where the module is coming from. You, 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 know, you, know, you know what to look for when you see a function call that fails. You're like, okay, well, I'm going to go look at this module. But when, really? It'll just stop asking me. Um, but because you're doing this parameter module construct and you're just calling, you know, p whatever, you can't just look at the code and say, "Well, I know what p is." Like it's not, it's not obvious unless you've properly named it something helpful. Um, because you would, you would have to ultimately inspect the value of p. You have to see, oh, okay. Well, the first, the the first. Uh, the first uh, element of the tuple is PMOD, so it's, we got to check the PMOD module for the code. And that's where that gets confusing. And that's largely the reason that the Erlang mailing list is so vehemently opposed to it, is because it does take away from that inherent readability that comes with Erlang program. Um, so, are there any questions on the parameter module, tuple module thing? Well, so, why you do this? Do you want to know why? Why was yeah, it was more of a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just it's for succinctness. I mean, it's if you look at um, you know the difference being this this construct versus this construct. Um, this is inherently. I mean, it's just shorter code. And if I mean, if this is if this is named well, you know, like if if you're making a game or something uh, and character is your thing and you have, you know, the variables called character or player or something, like you can pretty well infer where the code's coming from. So you could say like player, um, you know, reduce hit points 15 and it'll return a new, a new uh, player value. Whereas in this case you would just have to say player reduce HP 15 and then pass in the player variable. So it's not, I mean, it saves a little bit of code, but it does lead to some confusion. But I mean, it's ultimately you know, not much different than any other object-oriented language in that sense, where you have a variable, you don't necessarily know what that variable is unless you scan back up the code to see where it was defined. It's the same idea. What's up? Yeah. I think what Garrett said actually uh, kind of captures it. It's a closure at the module. So if you have a bunch of functions that are defined in a module that all depend on some common uh, some uh, common argument that you want to be able to uh, parameterize, sure. then you can change that only in one place when you construct that module. You're parameterizing a module with a different argument. So if you have like a testing database that has the same API as your regular database, then you just parameterize it with a different call, and you get to be polymorphic in the rest of your code, and not have to thread that extra argument in right. every time you define a new function in that one. Right. Yeah, that's a good that's a good use case. That that's true, but I mean, you're breaking the the abstraction that you expect from Erlang, right? Right. So it's explicit, and because I, I remember the first time I saw that code multi web, I got the same reaction. Yeah. What the hell is going on here? Right? Well, a bound function, a non anonymous function, which can be used as a closure, has the same problem. So you can pass functions around that have that are that are closures. So they right. have a state that aren't defined as arguments that they have access to. Right. So, they have, so they have access to the state that's not defined outside of those arguments, which I don't think anyone would, <coughs> would want to go away. Would, would want to get rid of anonymous functions or, or closures on functional level. So somebody said this when I first came into the community. My problem with this was that it, it, it drove a completely different style of programming. And you had this, like, this bifurcation. So you had MochiWeb and, 
and Chernobyl laws that had this sort of pseudo option oriented, and you didn't know what was going on, it's still felt magical. Um, and then you had like DICT, which always passes the state around, and it always, it was always like you, have, like you have the functions, and they're always separate from state. There's never any sort of implicit binding between functions, modules, and state. Right. So my complaint was that like it just, there should be one way to do it, and it should be consistent. So everyone knows what's going on. And it seems, that seems to be the full prevailing conclusion, but from a design standpoint, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with a closure. No, it's just, it just went, it kind of went like the oriented Pavlovian like instinct. It was just <laughs> what we want to. And people like try to use this to get this weird, and you don't have to. The fact is, it's not that expensive to pass another argument. And, and for tracing and for for just transparency and straightforwardness, sure. I would argue it's much better. I, I hate running those modules, but uh, I, I can see I mean, there's certainly logically nothing wrong with them. Right. I mean, they, they get the job done, but. But they do they, they do lend themselves to just a different style. Right? Yeah, just, they can't but yeah, like, 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 I did closure. It, it, it's, it's, it's consistent with it. So from a design elegant standpoint, like, like a design standpoint, it's consistent and fine. But I'm glad that the community is and just for anyone who's like wondering why I'm talking about this, I would say for me the takeaway would be approaching this approaching this from the outside would be the only community that hates magic. Like, as far as like either Ruby or even Python, and certain the Scala, like this idea of being able to leverage your language and do crazy things that are just like mystifying and powerful, like that is that is like will invoke the, the rage of the Scandinavians. <laughs> and Scandinavians are very conservative in their, they, they will make them angry. Because they don't like, like no one in their like likes like surprises. They're <laughs> functional new arguments. Uh, and that's it. Yeah. Do you understand that? Like, how far down the road you get with that? It's like you never ever want to go to like better programming or, or weird like just decorators and magical transformations and like stuff that doesn't make any sense. And JavaScript oriented stuff. It's almost the opposite of like JavaScript, like jQuery land and Ruby land and stuff. So. Yeah, it really is, and that's so. I mean, that's that's why some people like it, yeah. and then that's why a lot of the community dislikes it. Um, so, I mean, but the, 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 the okay. why if they wanted a contemporary behavior from their language, it has nothing to do with object oriented programming. The only similarity between parameterized modules and object oriented programming is the syntax. Yes. Of looking yeah. like you're saying, yeah, that's the drive. like object dot or object colon. That is the only similarity. Object. It was like driving. Nice people like them. <laughs> that was a terrible thing. <laughs> and, and that may be the case, but there there are lots of other functional languages that have similar functions. So the only thing that the only thing that the enclosure one you one instance of that is this kind of thing. So A B take the values you make the call you can have the net change or if you make this call repeatedly and say you can multiple instances of yeah. this it's just, it's just sugar to think of that extra extra cookie in for the good arguments. That's all it is. It's trickery. Yeah, it's very mechanical. But at, 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 the, at the beam file level, it's a simple trans part transformation. It's yeah. purely syntactical. There is no. It's just a way to get extra arguments in a function call without actually declaring them in your code. That's all it is. So then all it is. And only at the most cursory level. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, so anyway, the, the reason I bring it up is just because it's it's still really heavily heavily used. And Chicago Boss is one of the most popular web frameworks for Erlang. So it's you know it's and I don't see it changing anytime soon. Um, so in any case, that's uh, that parameter parameter model. Any uh, any other questions? Oh yeah, no. so uh Sydney Chicago Boss doesn't work on latest uh system models. Oh yeah, it absolutely does. And the, the reason that it does um is because of as soon as they deprecated it, the, the OTP team knew that there was plenty of projects that used it, like you deprecate like, okay, well now you know a pile of projects just don't work anymore. 
Um, they added, uh, they deployed a, an easy parse transform that you can bring in, and you can get it from, you know, from GitHub. You just download it, load it into your code, and you're fine. You can add it as a rebar dependency. And all you have to do is just make sure that you include this compile parse transform pmod pt function in your module, and then immediately converts it to a primary module. Otherwise, if you didn't have that in there, then, it will, then the compiler would just say, it doesn't support primary modules anymore. That's literally the error is, Erlang doesn't support primary modules anymore. The great news is you can use your own primary modules to do the most bizarre and crazy things that you want. Yes. It doesn't work as well. You actually can write your own parse transform to do all of those transformations. But it's just kind of shit. Yeah. It's not as easy as I'm not going to get into the, the parse transform. Beyond that. That's the least that. So, what's that? Oh. Okay, so any other questions on parameter modules and that uh, evidence? Okay, so um, I'm going to jump into another quick one. A really fast way to crash the Erlang VM is to just make a whole pile of atoms really fast. Um, this takes about a minute to crash, uh, to crash the default VM on my uh, crash laptop here. Um, but uh, the key to that is. Uh, um, the Erlang has an atom table, and that atom table has a limit. You can only have a certain number of atoms, and atoms are never garbage collected. Um, as a result of that, if you just start creating atoms on the fly all over the place, like making atoms from headers or like you know, user input or whatever, you're going to you're going to crash Erlang relatively quickly. And the default value is something like a little over a million. If you have a little over a million atoms, Erlang's going to crash. It's not going to give you like a, hey, you've got too many atoms here, and like keep running. It's just going to straight up break. Um, it'll tell you you've got too many atoms, but it's just it, the, the VM's going to shut down, and that's the end. Um, generally speaking, you want to avoid creating atoms on the fly like this unless you really trust the source. Um, list of atoms is the way that you create them. But if you're not certain and you want to make sure that you're not going to crash the VM by creating tons and tons of atoms from user input, you can use the list to existing atom function, which will then look through the existing atom table and say, is this already an atom? And if it is, we're going to use this. And if it's not an atom, we're going to break it. Um, then it just throws an error. Yo. So how do you have two atoms with different values? Let's see if I can see what's making Let's say I create an atom A, and then later on I'm going to create an atom A again. Well, you, once an atom's created, it's 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 yeah, in the atom. 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 An atom is an atom. Yes, no, it excludes food from birth. But you're not assigning a value to it. So, what I'm saying is, I create food. Yeah. And I create food again. And then the module is the same atom. Yeah. 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 You went from a string, which should be included from like a user input. So the string contains food. Yeah. But if it's, it contains food 2 or food 3 or food. Yeah. So food you'd be fine. But like if it was an input from a form, like a web-based form, like somebody said, here's my name and you can So that would run out of that first. So like for example here, let's do that. So as I just typed, I typed in the atom A and it returned an A. So we can type list to atom A and it'll work just fine. And we can type uh, list to existing atom A. And it'll still work. But if we type list to existing atom, and then just enter some garbage for an atom that hopefully has not been initialized, it's just going to give us an exception. Bad argument. And all this is telling us is this atom, that atom, HDFGFGFGFG, has never been used before. It's not in the early table. This isn't, this isn't something that exists already. So we're not going to use it, not going to create it. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, so uh, you know, be careful with atoms, and then if you really do need more than a million atoms, I can't think of a use case. Um, but if you do, you can increase the atom table limits using a plus D. And I thought that they were. Are they changing that? Is that being deprecated or something? The plus T. I thought someone said that at one point. Maybe I'm confusing it with something else. Okay. So plus T, if you were to, if you were to start early with plus T and then type in like 50 million, well, you can have an atom table with 50 million. It's going to use up more memory, and it's not only going to crash when it hits 50 million, 
But uh, if you're making 50 million atoms, you got bigger problems. Um, I'm going to skip over that one time. Um, early binaries. Oh, any questions on the app table thing before I move on? Okay, early binaries. Uh, early has a super neat optimization technique for dealing with large binaries. Um, and it's the idea that you can. Once a, a, a large binary is loaded, you load like a three gigabyte file into memory. It's not loaded directly into the process. It's loaded into a separate binary heap where it stores that. And then when you're passing, like if you were to pass that binary from one process to another within the same node, instead of having to copy that whole chunk of data, it just passes it as a, uh, as like a, 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 what's the term, a pointer. It's like just passing a pointer. And as a result, you have that memory savings. And even when you create a subbinary, so you load, you know, whatever, you load a three gigabyte file in memory, and you only want the last hundred bytes, or last couple hundred bytes, and you um, you, uh, you parse it off with uh, this function called binary part, you can get a portion of that binary. And instead of, again, instead of copying the binary, it just, the whole binary is in memory, and it just points to it and says, this is where that hundred bytes starts. And we're going to store that there. And just be aware of it, and then you pass it around, and you're always only passing that pointer around instead of copying memory. Um, and that's fantastic for message passing and I.O. purposes and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's a great optimization technique. But it leads to problems. And that problem is that, say you load this huge binary into memory, then you allocate, you, you, you take a portion of it, you you say, this, this is part of the binary, and we're going to use this. And then you discard the rest of the binary, and then you're just passing that 100 bytes around, and it's a long lived process for you know, what, hours or minutes or days or whatever. You got, you're going to notice that your VM is still holding on to that 3 gigabytes of data, and you're like, what the hell's going on? And the reason is because, because you've pointed to this sub-binary of this binary, Erlang has done this optimization of only passing the pointer around, and it's not going to clean up the rest of the binary that we don't care about. It just sees there's this one huge binary chunk, and it's got some pointers pointing to it, and we can't clean it up until there's nothing else using it at all in the system. So, um, so you end up, you know, wondering like, why is my VM using three gigabytes when it really shouldn't be? It, the, that huge file isn't even being used anymore. Um, and so <coughs> you ultimately have to release all the parts of that, all the subparts of that binary before the binary will be cleaned up. And the solution is to use binary copy. If you copy that binary, then you can discard the old one, and it, it explicitly tells the VM we're just going to copy this hundred bytes, and that's it. We're just going, and then this hundred bytes will be allocated alone in the heap process or in the, 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 in the heat, right? the binary heat. Um, and if you want to make sure that you're only copying it at the appropriate time, you can use binary reference byte size, which will tell you, even though you might have a 100, you know, 100 byte binary, if you uh, reference the, say, binary reference byte size, it'll tell you the full size that it's pointing to. And then you can use that as kind of a, you know, an indicator as to like, OK, well, we're, we're pointing to a huge binary. Let's copy it, the sub-binary, and then we can just to speed up your, uh, your system. So, any questions on that? Okay. All right. Here's another one that common people. Here's another one that's commonly hated by some uh, newcomers to the language. Is that most early structures are one indexed, meaning the very first, meaning index one is the very first item. A lot of people can be confused by that coming from C or any other language where everything is offset based, where zero is the very first item. So early structures are one index, except when they're not. The array module is zero index. I don't know if there's anything else that's zero indexed. I think it's just the array module is the standard zero index thing. But that's just one of those things that people run into and then they complain about like, oh my god, I can't believe I got to start a list of one. This is ridiculous. Um, so that was basically, that's a nice little quick one. Um, any questions on that? Okay, I, I thought not. Okay, we have uh, 
Another thing with Erlang is Erlang has leaky case statements. Um, and what that means is any variables that are defined in a case clause and in the case matching itself are available outside of the case. Um, and that's, I have a... So, so you would get chastised better by folk like Richard and Keith, you'd say that's an expression, a case expression. Yeah. If they're untrained or something, their expression for the United States. Yeah. Now it's yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's, I, I see, I see it both, what's up? I was going to say, did you have a line when you did that? I thought I tried that. You get shadow. Yeah, you get the, you get the shadow warning. Yeah, or the other one. There's a compiler option, too. Yeah. I, I don't remember what the compiler option is off the top of my head. I never, I never worry about it. It's just one of those things. Um, and then, of course, because of that, the leaky case statement thing, you can also have variables that are defined in certain clauses that are only defined in certain clauses. And then if you like try to reuse them later, we're like just going to say this is unsafe. And it's just going to give you an error and it's not going to work. Um, but the idea here is that in this, we have this case statement and why is available outside of the case. The case, what were you saying? The case the expression. expression. Yeah. Case expression, yeah. not a case statement. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I beg forgiveness. <laughs> um, <laughs> Fortunately, there's only like five terms in Erlang, so it's like, you don't have to worry about it. So. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Y is available outside of the case, Y2 is available outside of the case, and then Y3, trying to use it anywhere else, will just throw an error because it's unsafe. Um, and that can be kind of, you know, kind of unclear. Like, I, I'm, I'm of the impression that I would prefer that that stuff is, you know, like isolated instead of exported, automatically exported to the case. Function. Yeah. Well, that's that's the so you can, What's that? A function will isolate. It will. It will. So a partial solution to this function, to this to this problem, is to wrap the clauses with fun end and then immediately call it. That's pretty hacky and pretty crappy. Um, what's that? It's just the worst thing ever. <laughs> but I was like, yeah, asterisk never do this. <laughs> yeah, asterisk you should you should do. basically never do that. Yeah. But it's it's doable. You can make a parse transform that automatically does that in your case statements. If you if you're really but it's still not gonna fix the fact that the match is still like <coughs> the Y would still be exported from that. Um, the better solution is just to refactor it into multiple function clauses. That's a, a far more suitable and far more Erlangish solution. Than really worrying about the whole case. A lot of most of the times, like a big case can be converted into multiple function clauses, and that's just more straightforward. Um, so, yeah, it's just a good one. All right, here's a fun one. This is the fun one uh, that hits hits some folks. This is so in this call that I've written here. This bin equals this thing. Uh, I mean, I'd say, does anybody see it? But I know a couple of you immediately see what's going on. What's going to, why this is going to crash. And that's going to give this error. Does anyone see it? Who, who isn't like a crazy, like not crazy, but you know. <laughs> I'm trying to say that bin is less than or equal to, obviously. Obviously, yeah. So, how, it's, how it's, crazy is that? it's, I mean, it's just, it's one of those like, it's one of those errors that a new running into it is going to be like, what the hell's going on? That doesn't make any sense. That is the worst. If I get, if I get to spend one token to fix something, that's the worst. It is. It's it's absurd. It's a single problem. They finally fixed it. Yeah. Well, it doesn't seem interesting. This is so annoying. Someone's made a patch a few months back and got Really? Yeah, no, it's not, it's not, there's some reason. There's some usually they have a reason for it, but this was just not as just like no straight up is not worth it. <laughs> no, yeah, so um, the obvious is just the fact that uh, Erlang, the less than or equal to symbol, is equal to less than. Um, and so it so, precedes the other. So this is equal to less than. So it's good. It's the equivalent of typing bin equals to or less than this broken thing. So that's it. It's just an ambiguity and the language solves it in that broken way. So never use binaries. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the solution. That's the solution. Yeah. So a little, a little quick easy.
gotcha. Okay, time for an evolution. So this is fun. Um, let's go with this. So we've got we've got a list of records. And let's Is that still legible? No, that's crap. I guess I'll just go back to the big one. What are you doing? Okay. So we have this list of records. We just got fruitcake, banana, watermelon, and lemon. And all it is is just a list. So we're going to call. We're going to call food list. That's not good. That's not good. Food list. Have those four.
We're not even a clause. That's weird. Yeah, that's what's weird. Yeah, there's no clause. So this is line 11, is this, this blah record. So it's trying to match this against this and saying these two will, these records don't match, they will never match, and then it just throws the no clause will ever, will ever match here. Pam, when you get that error, that's, that's pretty cryptic. That's one of the more cryptic errors I've, I've encountered with the lists of mismatched records that you forget a comma. So if you ever see that, and you're like, hey, I don't have any clauses anywhere except for the one function clause, and it's not matching anything. What's going on? So I wonder if record, if the syntactic sugar of our records involves like some low-level like, quarreling case transformation. Because like the clause is specific to cases and functions. Yeah. I've never seen it outside. Yeah. I, I, I would imagine it does since records just get compiled back to tools. So we just does some pattern matching on tools. Yeah, right. And yeah. it will never so match. So it's like a core like, it's like a lower level compiler or warning after the transform. Yeah. So the code that gets written probably always pattern matches on blah as the first element and you're passing it through. Yeah. So it skips all of those mm. and runs off the end of the same thing. At least that's my guess. That's, that's true. That sounds like a sound guess. That sounds uh but you're right. But yeah, that's tricky. Yeah, so that's you tricky. You can do the core like, so you can, you can uh, this way you can pile it into the core like, and see the actual core. Right, see the code that it produces, yeah. I don't, I don't remember how to do that. I don't remember how to do that. No. no. I guess that's that, another topic. I can say those words for that. <laughs> so if you see records getting squashed or outlet removed from a list, now you know. Um, so careful about those trailing counts. Um, yeah, this is Armstrong had it, yeah. This is a, Great thing. Posted the two side by side with the space between them. He's like, is this an error? And he was thinking that it was converting, what he was thinking was that it was converting them to uh, tuples first and then seeing, he was thinking that that comparison would be like having, having it automatically converted to like this in the code without the, the comment. And he was thinking that should throw an error. But that's obviously not what it's doing. So, in any case, interesting stuff there. Um, any questions on that? Thanks, that's it. So, I don't think many people have, it like the string is integers, I don't think. They never really run into those other options at all. The progress modules are. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's one of those that I brought up because I was like, it's still something, it's something that confused me when I started. But, uh, let's do this, sure, that's, that, yeah, that's still, that's still a new thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
binary. The binary equals set. Yeah. If they turn it out, I'd, I'd love to see the patch and the reason that it's turned that down. Other sorts? Yeah. Other sorts of radiations? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. There's not really a question like that. Like, I think if the Jones was just as it was 10 times bigger, it would basically be a problem. Okay. I think. So the try this is speaking is not it, it hasn't been, I don't know. I mean, the problem is when people are like Gen Server 2, and there's like four around it. That's really a little stupid. Frankly, it's just it's bad. But, um, is it because try to keep your installations smaller? Yes. Less dependencies, less, there's not that many libraries. And when you have a JSON library, they're going to have to throw a brand name. JSX, 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 so, so like, it only takes a few characters to give you a good isolation in your name spaces. So it's like domain names or anything else. It's not, you don't have to have super, super deep nested. Your job is like, well, we use like a reverse, you know, like TLD net dot, or, you know, what is it? Java. What, what's the domain yeah. reverse? Yeah. Or yeah. Dot Java yeah. dot. Like, you can have like, like 15 trillion space <laughs> name space before you even get started with the problem. So, practically <laughs> speaking, it hasn't. There are yeah, there's trade-offs to the domain. Like the nice thing about having the domain uh, is that it gives you a form it's really easy to publish that form to one central place and distinguish between the two forms. Erlang doesn't need to have a centralized repository of code, so it's kind of a matter. I like the idea of like being able to really copy a set of code and create a standalone release where you're not sucking. So you basically resolve all the events in the file and then you have, you have an independent you know, use like say I do. Programs do that, but they're long-established practices, avoiding 